So welcome everybody. We're pleased that you could join us for the Invasive Species Council of Metro Vancouver's annual general meeting and fall forum. I'm the executive director, Tasha Murray. I'm waving, I've got a pink scarf on. And this is our first online forum. Normally we would gather in person and we'd be serving you lunch and taking you on field tours during our fall session. And there'd be so many great connections made between all of you. Um, so I'm, I'm sad that we're not together in person, but I'm really grateful that we still have the opportunity to meet online and to gather virtually. So my colleague Isabel is helping to host this meeting. She's at our office in Vancouver, and I am currently at my home in Burnaby, and I would like to thank the Coast Salish nations of Musqueam, tsleil and Squamish, on whose traditional territory I live and I'm working today. But of course, we're all in different places today. And one of the benefits of having an online forum is that we can accommodate people who might not otherwise be able to travel to the Lower Mainland. So we have 69 people who are registered for the forum today. Um, I, we don't have quite that many yet, but probably people will still continue to join in the first few minutes. Um, I'm gonna send out a poll right now. I'm really curious where all of you are from. So where are you joining from today? I know we have lots from within Metro Vancouver. We've got some from outside the region. I'm not sure if we have anybody outside of BC. We'll, we'll see shortly. I know probably not everybody will be able to vote. If you're, if you're phoning in, you won't be able to vote. So you won't have seen that there's a little pop-up on the screen um, asking you where you're calling in from today. All right. So here are the results. So it looks like 76% for Metro Vancouver and then um, a good percentage from elsewhere in BC too, which is great. Welcome to all of you from outside of Metro Vancouver who might not normally be able to be here. All right, so I'm going to begin my screen share. All right, so most of you are probably familiar with Zoom, but I did want to highlight a few important features. If you hover down at the bottom of your screen or it could be at the top of your screen, you'll see something similar to what's on the middle of my screen. There's a menu with some options, so please keep yourselves muted um, during the call unless you're going to be speaking. The video is up to you, but if you're having intermittent internet or if the Zoom meeting freezes once in a while for you, it may help to turn your video off. You can also use the chat box to ask questions of our guest speakers, which will be addressed um, after each of the presentations. Another handy feature is there are different options for viewing on your screen. So up at the top, you'll find a number of di different buttons that will allow you to either see an active speaker screen or all the participants in a panel or even a side-by-side -side mode of somebody's screen sharing as I'm doing right now. Also, this forum is being recorded, and for all the registered participants, I'll provide a follow-up message um, to everyone who registered, probably early next week, and I'll provide a link to where you can download the recording and also any other resources or links that we share during the meeting today, so you don't have to worry about furiously taking notes. We'll make sure that everything mentioned you'll have access to um, on our website afterwards. We found that lots of questions are generated during these online sessions, so if the speakers don't have enough time to address all of the questions, they've agreed to provide answers after the session, and these will be also loaded onto the website that I'll provide the link for um, in a couple of days in an email. So here is our agenda for today, and this also is available on our website. Isabel can pop the link for that um, into the chat. Just want to draw your attention to a few documents that are available on our website. Um, so that includes the agenda and then a number of um, business items that we're gonna cover during our AGM portion. So during the AGM, we'll be inviting members to vote on a few of these documents. So when you register for this event, you are asked if you'd like to become a member of the ISCMV. Membership is free and it's open to anyone and members are allowed to vote during the AGM. So if you agree to be a member, that's great. You can vote when the time comes. If you don't want to become a member, then you can just skip those votes. Um, you're welcome to change your mind from however you registered. So basically you confirm your membership by participating in the voting or you can decline membership by abstaining from voting. 
just a little bit about the Invasive Species Council of Metro Vancouver, if this is um, a new opportunity for you to connect with us. We are a non-for-profit society established in 2006, and our job is really to help make all of your jobs a bit easier with respect to managing invasive species in the Metro Vancouver region. And we have an education and outreach program, um, a small operations program, we offer consulting services and a, a number of different um, ways that we can help you with the work that you're doing. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our first guest speaker. So Richard, I'm gonna stop screen sharing so you can go ahead and get your screen um, started while I introduce you. So we're so pleased that Dr. Richard Hamlin is joining us today. Some of you might um, recognize him or his name from some media coverage earlier this summer. Um, Dr. Hamlin obtained a Bachelor of Science from McGill University in 1982, a Master's of Pest Management from Simon Fraser University in 1986, and a PhD from the University of Kentucky in 1990. He has 30 years of experience in forest health research and has published over 150 peer-reviewed scientific articles. His work aims at using genomics to better understand forest disease epidemics in the face of climate change and to design detection and monitoring methods to prevent invasions of pests and pathogens that threaten forests. And today, he's here to present tools that allow on-site detection of forest invasive species. Um, and just before you take over, Richard, I'll also mention that um, if you'd like to download a description of the presentations today, as well as complete bios for all of our speakers, including Richard, you can find that on the agenda on our website. Take it away. Well, thank you very much, Tasha, and hi, everyone. It's a, it's a pleasure for me to be with you uh, this morning. Um, I really like um, to sort of come out of academia where I do uh, much of my research uh, and to talk to people who are actually on the ground and, and dealing with sort of real life problem. And, and uh, the idea that the research that we do can impact some some um, areas of the real world is always sort of a big a big driver to me, um, and so this is this fits very well because uh, what I want to talk to you about today is um, this new approach that we developed to uh, conduct DNA testing in real time to detect uh, forest invasive species. Now, I'm on faculty of forestry, I know that invasive species looks at much broader than just forestry, but certainly uh, forestry in BC is a big is a big deal. And also, of course, in our in our municipalities, uh, we have a lot of forests and trees and parks. Uh, so it is absolutely uh, uh, relevant and important to um, to protect those trees. So we live in this uh, era that, uh, you know, we call the Anthropocene. That's the era during which like one animal species on the planet, Homo sapiens, is changing the planet in ways that are most likely irreversible. And this affects the forest, it affects the planet really, but, but if we think of the forest, the, the biggest impact on the forests are domestication. So our you know, ability to take trees um, and plant in the forest and to domesticate them and essentially just select the faster growers, uh, select the uh, ones that have the best characteristics that we want. And then eventually we kind of homogenize forests uh, or, you know, again, if you think of cities, uh, the trees that we plant in the cities, we kind of like, and that's something that, that humans do, we, we like to kind of narrow it down to as few varieties as possible uh, because it's easier to manage. Um, the other big driver uh, in the Anthropocene is climate change. And this is, it's just in the last few decades really, but climate change is, is happening and we know that it's impacting the forest and and what we don't know is um, you know what to do about it and and in what direction it's going to go so we know that things are going to get warmer but what is it going to do to um, insects and diseases um, some of them will be losers they'll get too warm or too dry but some of them will be winners trees are going to get a little more stressed um, or the, the temperature is going to be right for their survival and so on. So 
it's a big black box uh, going into the future that uh, we are uh, studying. But today I want to focus uh, on, uh, let's see here if I can use some, uh, I'm gonna do the mouse here. Can you see my mouse? Yep. I'm guessing yes. Okay, so uh, we're going to focus uh, today. I'm going to uh, tell you about uh, uh, invasive uh, alien species affecting uh, the forest because that's a topic that I'm particularly um, interested in and uh, and on working on. So, uh, in global invasive species, basically that's it's the result of globalization uh, that is responsible. Uh, for a number of alien species uh, coming to our shores. And that number has been rising over the last century. The numbers are, are, are clear on this. And this is just a shot to, sh you know, so to share with you that uh, all this increase in travel, all this increase in maritime transport that comes with globalization is how a lot of these invasive species are, are traveling around. Now the, you know, the uh, invasive species are not certainly not traveling first class on on airplanes, uh, but there are ways that they uh, that they take advantage um, of, of this globalization and, and can get established elsewhere. So what are the, uh, the uh, boop, let's see here. Okay, um, so one of the things about uh, insects and pathogens of, uh, of trees is that they can be propagated on wood packing material and lime. So any big ship that you see in the port of Vancouver uh, that comes from Asia has uh, wood packing material, crates uh, and, and boards and uh, that are boxes that are used to carry the material that we import or that we export. Um, and in that wood, that wood tends to be uh, the cheapest, basically. Uh, and in that wood, frequently you find these galleries, galleries caused by insects. These insects often carry fungi that can be pathogenic. So that's what, certainly one route of dissemination. And we know many invasive species that came through this route. Um, the other uh, pathway is what we call the plant for planting um, industry, live plants that we import. Of course, in beautiful gardens, we like to plant stuff that looks a little exotic. Uh, and a lot of time those come from other countries across the border uh, and even Asia and, um, and, and Europe. And of course, the things that we don't see uh, is that inside these plants, you've all heard of the microbiomes. Uh, these plants have their own microbiome. They don't come. They, they don't come just themselves. The plant they come with whatever is in their microbiome, in their leaves, inside their leaves, in their stems, in the bark, in their roots, in the soil. So that's a big, you know, that's a big way that that these uh, invasive, especially the pathogens, can come um, can come to our, our country, and so overall globally, I'd say you know we witnessing now a um, an unreplicated experiment of mixing biota. That's kind of how I look at it. You know, we're mixing biota across the planet. Um, and, um, you know, some species are going to be winners, some species are, are going to be losers, but it's kind of, it's really an unreplicated experiment. We don't know exactly where it's going to lead. But we do know that in some cases it's catastrophic. Uh, and um, I'm only going to name you a couple, not to make you too depressed. Uh, but uh, certainly the invasive tree diseases can cause irreversible uh, changes to forest ecosystems. Uh, Dutch elm disease may be one of the most striking examples. Uh, it was introduced at the uh, beginning of the uh, last century. And uh, it, it's, it's a pathogen that's carried by an insect. And once it was introduced, it killed hundreds of millions of trees in both cities uh, and forests. Uh, a relentless killer. Uh, people say worldwide it's billions of elm trees that were killed. 
uh, and it's still on the move. Uh, it was actually in the news this summer. It was discovered uh, in Ledbridge, Alberta, further west than, uh, uh, than it has been reported, inching towards BC, um, and also in Saskatoon. So uh, in those cities now, they're working really hard to try to uh, preventing from, uh, from establishing. Now, we don't have it in BC, uh, but since, the, since it's now in Alberta, uh, Saskatchewan, Alberta, and Oregon. I'm thinking that BC is kind of the next stop for this uh, for this disease. Another one that, uh, well, maybe in the municipality, it's not maybe not as important, but certainly uh, in the forest and in forest ecosystems, uh, the white pine blisterus is one of the most devastating diseases of pines. Uh, white pines of North America have been decimated by this disease that was again introduced from uh, Asia via Europe. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, it for sure it affected the uh, white pine um, populations. We basically, white pine has kind of disappeared from the landscape. It used to be up to 25% of the trees. Uh, you know, forest ecosystems were white pines, and now it's basically less than 1%. Um, but now it's actually going up and endangering uh, uh, alpine e ecosystems. And uh, the dramatic aspect of it is uh, some of the white pine, like the white bark pine, for example, is uh, uh, what we call a keystone species. So this is a species that when it goes, a bunch of other species of, are affected. And that's because the grizzly bear feed on the pine nuts, uh, and the, uh, the pines themselves prevent erosion. Under these pines, you have uh, all kinds of plants and, and small animals and, and even birds uh, using that sort of ecosystems under the pine. So when the pines go, there's a whole lot of species that, that, that go with it. Uh, and because of that, the uh, white, uh, white bark pine uh, is listed as an endangered species. And closer to home, actually, right in my backyard, this is uh, 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 Port Orford Cedar at uh, near Kids Beach, uh, right in front of the pool there. That's the bathroom next to the pool. Uh, and uh, uh, I want to tell you this because that's a pathogen that I mean, most people don't even know about it, but it's a, it's a deadly killer. And we have it in Vancouver, uh, and it's an invasive. It's a, it's not native, so it's it's exotic. Um, and uh, it actually can kill portofor cedar very rapidly. I walk in front of this tree uh, almost daily, uh, and just last June, bang, it just turned red, and it's killed by a, a pathogen called Phytophthora lateralis. Uh, that's a close relative of Phytophthora romorum. Now, uh, this one here is a huge concern because it's, it causes sudden oak death. It can kill uh, uh, oak trees, but also larch. Uh, and it can attack about a hundred different hosts. Uh, so that's one that we definitely don't want to have spread out in BC. Um, we have it in BCs, but only in nurseries. It's confined to nurseries, but uh, in places just south of the border in California, Oregon, and Washington State, especially in Washington, in uh, Oregon, this disease has escaped nurseries and is now attacking trees in um, in the forest. So, uh, so that's something we, we want to keep an eye on. These Phytophthora pathogens, are, they, they're highly unpredictable, so we, we want to keep an eye on them. So we, I don't, don't need to convince you of this uh, because it's, at, it's on your website, you actually say this, but the most efficient and, and least costly defense against these uh, future invasions is uh, early working early prevention and that's when you can have the most bang for your buck okay and we all know this instinctively but uh this figure just kind of reminds us that you know if you can nip it in the bud uh, you, you you reduce the cost dramatically. Asian longhorn beetle in Toronto cost $25 million to eradicate. It sounded like a big number, uh, but Emerald Asbor is costing billions of dollars to uh, Quebec, Ontario and the Maritime. So uh, it, it is, it is the prevention is, is, is of the essence. And again, you know this, but uh, the it, prevention requires monitoring, surveillance, and that is challenging. And that's because, especially if I'm talking here about insects and pathogens, um, you know, you encounter 
uh, it's, it's biology, right? So you encounter um, insects and pathogens at different life stages. These are eggs, for example, uh, of the gypsy moth. Um, and uh, to be able to recognize from the eggs or from the larvae, um, you know, hundreds or thousands of different species uh, is challenging. When we talk about fungi, we talk about spores or mycelium thing, microscopic fruiting bodies, really, really, really hard to be able to recognize all of this. So, so the ability to rapidly and accurately identify pests and pathogens at different life stages, that's one of the big challenges when you do uh, monitoring and surveillance. <clears throat> and that's what you need to assess risk, okay? Because a lot of these invasive or potential invasive species have close relatives at home, here, sorry. Uh, and it's important to be able to tell them apart. Is this something that we have here already that's endemic that we don't need to worry about? Or is it something that we've never seen uh, that has the potential for uh, wrecking havoc in our, in our ecosystems? And, and the last challenge is knowing where things come from. And almost uh, every time I, I talk to someone who's dealing with a, a new invasive, invasive species problem, uh, the first question is like, where did they get from? Where did we get it from? Um, when I was in Quebec City, when the emerald borer showed up, you know, and I got a phone call, the first thing is like, where do you think we got it from? And so that's because, you know, you want to know where it comes from so you can actually block the pathways, the pathways of entrance. Um, and so that's, that's really uh, important also in, in the prevention. Okay, so um, in the last two, three decades, there's been a, a revolution in, in biology, and that is uh, the remarkable advance in genomic technologies. And, and that's mostly been driven by the medical field, okay? Uh, the, when, when I was doing my, uh, my PhD, uh, back in the 1990s, uh, you know, you could do a whole PhD thesis sequencing a single gene, uh, and, uh, you know, that would be, you know, uh, considered a, a, a significant discovery. Now we sequence entire genomes. And, and uh, this is driven by the, uh, by the medical field, but we are lucky in the field of well, forestry or, or invasive species because we really benefit from these advances. The sequencing of the first human genome cost $3 billion. And then uh, the scientists said, well, we can't stop there. We have to sequence like a whole bunch of more genomes. We can't stop at one. Uh, and that's why the technology was developed to make it faster, cheaper. Uh, and now you can get a human genome sequence for between a hundred and a thousand dollars. And this has been fantastic for us uh, because it means that once you get DNA, uh, you can use the same tool. So if I can get DNA from my insect or my pathogen or my tree, um, I can use exactly the same tools that are used in the human genome to sequence the genome of the organisms that I'm interested in. So based on that, we launched a project that we call BioSafe, Biosurveillance of uh, Alien Forest Enemies. Our idea was that we were going to uh, apply some of this genomics technology so that we can develop tools uh, to monitor, survey, and assess the risk of uh, invasive uh, sp species. And we, we are targeting some of the most unwanted or the least wanted uh, forest invasive uh, alien species, the uh, Asia, Asian gypsy moth, Asian longhorn beetle, Dutch elm disease, and sudden oak death as a sort of a, a as a show uh, case uh, that, you know, uh, the pipeline approaches we develop uh, can be applied to, you know, any of these groups of uh, organisms. And, and our thinking is that uh, this is a story written in code. Uh, in the genomes of these uh, insects and, and pathogen are written um, the history really of these species. 
and uh, answer to some of our questions will be will come once we decode their genomes. Um, so, for example, what is the identity of a sample? Uh, for sure, sequencing the genome, we can we can find uh, what it is and where it comes from. Uh, similar to a lot of people, human human people uh, sequence their own genome, so they, because they want to know, am I African? Am I Irish? Um, and uh, and then do I am I susceptible to this or that disease? Uh, so very very similarly, we can do uh, the same with these uh, insects and, and, and pathogen. And uh, maybe more exciting for me is that we can also identify where they came from. And I'll show you in the next uh, slide how uh, this can become a very very powerful tool to assess where did this you know gypsy moth come from or, or this uh, longhorn beetle come from. Uh, and I'm going to show you one slide of results, and I promise this this is the only one. But uh, just to, just to show you that uh, this is a slide about uh, gypsy moth. This is in a, a backyard in uh, Toronto, and this is uh, the caterpillar, a very characteristic. Um, and uh, this is the European gypsy moth that was introduced, uh, not accidentally, actually willingly from, from Europe in the 1800s uh, to make silk. And then it kind of got out of hand. And now it's an invasive species throughout Eastern North America. Um, and we have it here, not established, but certainly every year we find some in uh, British Columbia. So that's why it's so important to us. And it does a mess with your uh, trees. Uh, it, it eats the foliage uh, and a single caterpillar can eat the equivalent of 15 oak leaves. And if you have thousands of those, uh, an oak tree can be completely defoliated in a few, uh, few weeks. And uh, the interest, for our interest was to get um, uh, gypsy moth from around the world and sequence their genome and then try to see what we can extract from those genomes. And, and uh, what's important is that you can see this, uh, these are sort of the samples that we sequence the genome of. So based on their genome, they can be grouped into two, two big groups and some of them are weak fly, the females are weak flyers and these belong to the European gypsy moth group. Um, and others are strong, females are strong flyers, and these belong to the Asian gypsy moth group. Um, and uh, that's important because basically you can look at the caterpillars or, or even the adults of these two groups and you won't be able to tell them apart, at least not easily. Uh, so you really need another way to do that, and that's where uh, genomic comes from. This is super important, of course, because this is already established in Eastern and North America and in Europe, uh, but we, we don't have it established yet in BC, so we want to be able to, to know, um, you know, if we find in our traps uh, a gypsy moth, uh, is it the Eastern North American one, or is it the much more damaging, potentially Asian one that can fly 25 kilometers and lay 1,500 eggs, sorry, 1,500 eggs, uh, you know, down, uh, down the forest. So we've gotten really good at this. Uh, we've done a lot of work around this. We have developed DNA tests that can differentiate between these two. Uh, and that can even take an unknown and assign it to a source, you know, whether it's from Spain or from Belgium or from Siberia or China, okay? So given an unknown sample. So that's very, very powerful. But that's genomics and that requires uh, a well-equipped lab, experienced personnel, uh, you know, these equipments are all tabletop, okay? And my, you know, although we're really excited about this work, but in the back of my mind, I've always thought it's just too bad because uh, a lot of our work is done in the forest or at least in places where we, we don't have a lab with us. Um, and uh, this is where, when we need to have our results. We want to have our results on the site. Uh, because if you do find something that you know you need to take rapid actions about, uh, you want it as soon as possible and on the site so you can actually do more more sampling and testing. So uh, we embarked in this idea of uh, well taking genomics to the field uh, and develop a pack sack ready uh, DNA testing uh, so that you can. Uh, 
put everything you, that you need. We basically um, took the DNA testing to the bare bones and got rid of everything in the lab that we didn't need to get and kind of tweaked some of the reagents uh, so that we don't need to have a fridge or we don't need to have a centrifuge or we don't need to have any kind of fancy equipment. Uh, and uh, in the end, you can put everything in your backpack. And this is my, uh, this, when we did this media release, I invited uh, uh, Global News uh, and this is the, the, my lab bench is actually an old the Douglas first stump. And I did all my experiment. I did a demo to them. I did all my experiment on the old uh, Douglas first stump. Um, and, um, and you can do your uh, DNA testing without any more instrument than you have there. And it can be done in uh, uh, less than two hours. So we're pretty excited about about uh, this uh, this development, and I'm just going to take you quickly through what we're doing. So, in this case, we have set up traps for uh, gypsy moth, and uh, you know we can take any body part of the gypsy moth because each body part has the same DNA. So we don't have to worry about whether it's an antenna or a piece of wing or a leg. And uh, we do find that the uh, antenna work particularly well because they have a lot of cells apparently for sensing. Uh, so we like the, the antenna when they're available, but any other body part can do. Uh, and uh, you can do this with, so any insect part, could be eggs, could be larvae, could be adults. Uh, and here I'm just showing you, you can also do it on uh, wood. This is a white pine infected by white pine blisteros. Basically just chip a little piece of bark and under the bark, that's where the fungus hides. And uh, you can uh, get the DNA out of that. So basically uh, the idea is that if, if there's DNA here, there's you know pure uh, gypsy moth DNA. Here we have kind of mixtures of DNA of the the tree uh, and the pathogen, but that does not matter to us because uh, we have probes that are specific to, uh, to the pathogen. And the, we simplify the DNA extraction to the bare bones. Basically, we just take that little piece here, put in a little tube, uh, and then we have uh, 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 a substance in, in this micro tube that contains some very safe chemicals that we kind of macerate, and then we just kind of uh, you know, do a little push up and down, you know, for a couple of minutes. Uh, that's all, that's all that's needed. We don't need anything fancier than that. That's enough to release some of the DNA of the material that we put in. Uh, and then we take our samples and place them in what's called a portable thermal cycler. Uh, people in my lab call it the little black box. Um, and that's just an instrument that's uh, a thermal cycler. So it's a an instrument that you know, heat and cools at a regular cycle that you can program. And that's all we need for DNA amplification. So uh, these cycles of the PCR that people are talking about now uh, with the COVID crisis, um, that's exactly the same, uh, same reaction that we're using in this little, uh, this little black box. So our DNA is in, inside of those little tubes. And in those little tubes are all these reagents that we dried out prior to so that you don't need to carry a fridge. And they're stable at room temperature for a year. We tested them up to a year. So you could leave those little tubes in your backpack for a year and you know, at the bottom of your wardrobe, uh, take it out when you want to go out and then uh, you know, stick it in the instrument with, uh, with your sample and they're going to work within, within a year uh, without even having a fridge. And the beauty is that you can interact with, uh, with your iPhone. So basically you could uh, set up your experiment there on your <laughs> Douglas first stump. Uh, and then you can walk away uh, and then you can uh, monitor uh, your reaction from your iPhone uh, with, so within two hours, sometimes earlier than two hours. And we're trying to make it a little faster because two hours is fast. Uh, compared to, it would take weeks if you take the samples to the lab just because of the, the traveling and all that. So two hours is fast, but we're trying to get it actually even faster than that. We think we can get in about an hour. Uh, so that's work, work that we're doing now. Uh, but then you can see a very easy thing to see. The, the, the curve is going up. That means that we have DNA of the target. In this case, it was white palm blister us. 
uh, and uh, that's in our sample so that we got a positive with Wi-Fi and blister us. Very, very fast, accurate, and convenient. The beauty then is if you do this in the field so you can have real-time monitoring because the results can be uploaded in the cloud uh, for that uh, real-time monitoring. So uh, my vision of this is that you can have like different crews uh, on, um, on, on sites doing their surveys and then you know they collect their samples, extract their DNA, they do the PCR, uh, upload it in the cloud, and then centrally, uh, everybody has access to the same data. Then you can get your analysis done. Uh, is it the Gypsy Moth? Yes. Uh, is it the European Gypsy Moth? Yes. Uh, is it Asian Gypsy Moth? Yes. And then you can actually, you know, uh, prepare your action in uh, consequence, and then uh, you can map this so that everybody uh, uh, on the crew, and even um, the bigger picture is really everybody, like in the province and even nationally, would have access to the same data, so that we know what is where, when, uh, and really have uh, real-time monitoring. And this. This could be done for any organism for which uh, you know we need to have um, uh, we need to have information. Okay, what is next? Well, everything that I've told you so far is super exciting uh, to me uh, to be able to just take your backpack and go and do your testing in the field. The only problem—it's not really a problem—but the only caveat is that you need to know what you're looking for. So if, if in this case, I was looking for uh, Asian and European gypsy moth, those are the two that I was looking for, then I can go out and do my testing and this was gonna work beautifully. Uh, if you had the same thing for a plant, it would do the same. The problem is if there's an unknown. So I, I get you know a rhododendron sent from California, it's diseased and I don't know what it is, uh, then uh, you need to go much deeper. And this is where, uh, to me, the next uh, revolution is going to be uh, the genome in the hand. And instead of having just a, a PCR uh, reaction that will target you know, one or two or three organisms that you know already, you're just going to sequence the genome. And then based on that genome, you're going to predict what it is uh, if it poses a risk, just based on the genomic profile, uh, and then so that you can decide, you know, what to do about it. And uh, this is really uh, the future. There's already people in the medical field, again, always the medical field leading on this. There's already people in the medical field here uh, testing the Zika virus in Brazil uh, using a, a USB size. It's just not a USB size, it's actually uh, a sequencer that you plug into your computer uh, via USB and, uh, and that can uh, do the on-site uh, sequencing of the genome. So very, very exciting uh, stuff coming, uh, coming down the pipeline. Okay, so that's all I had for you. Thank you so much for uh, listening and thank you for uh, what you do against invasive species. I'm a lover of nature, of course, do a lot of hiking uh, and, uh, you know, uh, I'm, um, I, I am very, very keen on helping uh, to protect the forests uh, and preventing some of these uh, deadly outbreaks that, you um, um, that are, you know, in most cases, irreversible. So uh, thank you again for your work. And uh, I look forward to answering uh, your questions either now or in the chat or, um, or online uh, afterwards. Great, thank you, Richard, that was excellent. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat yet, but we probably have time for one, or if you're, still thinking about them you can pop them in the chat at any time during the session today or send them to me afterwards and i will be sure to follow up um, and just a reminder for those that might have joined a little bit late this session is being recorded and i will follow up in a couple of days with an email to everybody who's registered with a link to the recording and to any of the follow-up resources and you know questions that we're going to talk about during today's session all right, I do have a one question from Becky Brown. This is a great one to start with. 
Um, I'll go ahead and read it out for you, Richard. How do you envision a lay person using this portable tool? How would the tool be calibrated to analyze the DNA for a specific species? So that's a great question, actually. And I should mention, I should have mentioned that uh, this summer we um, uh, we put uh, an instrument and and the kits in the hands of two foresters, uh, and we sent one of, one of my technician went with them, and those were foresters who had never worked in a lab before, and we wanted to test exactly that question: can can we put it in the hands of uh, a practitioner out in the field, um, and um, and and just see how they see how they perform and it worked great actually at the end of the day uh they said you know we want to have one of these for every forester doing surveys uh, for the province so they had really no um no you know technical problems now um so you can you can learn it quickly you don't need any kind of special skills now the uh, the bigger challenge is to develop the the the, the probe for uh, whatever use you would need. So if you wanted to use it on a plant, uh, you know we would we would have to um, we would have to make sure that we well that we develop the right probes and that the extraction works for the type of tissues uh, you have in mind. Leaves usually work really well. Uh, bark kind of okay. Uh, roots we tend to have more problems just because there's, you know, uh, a lot of times soil attach and some phenolics inhibiting the, the reaction or the extraction. So uh, so, but but there's no. Um, I would say technically, it's 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 very simple. Great, thank you, Richard. So there's a few other questions that are coming in, but we have a very tight schedule. And so I'm gonna move along to the next portion of the agenda and Richard, I'll be in touch with you right after the session to send you all those questions to follow up on. All right, this is going to be our fastest AGM ever. And um, I'm gonna invite our chair, Melinda Young, to start us off. There's a, actually a few other directors and Melinda and myself who are gonna be tag teaming this portion, but I'm going to ask Melinda to start us off. Hello, um, thank you, Tasha and Isabel for uh, organizing our first online AGM and fall forum. Uh, so far it's going great um, and also uh, thank you to Dr. Hamlin and um, his interesting uh, work. I uh, am looking forward to seeing what that uh, brings to the uh, invasive plant field and uh, also looking forward to hearing about um, was it Daphne later this afternoon from Rob Underhill. So I'll quickly move along. Um, oh, sorry. And I also want to thank everybody for attending today. Um, it being our first online uh, forum and AGM, it's great to uh, see uh, so many people still participating. But our first order of business is to approve the last AGM minutes from May 1st, 2019, when we met at the Langley Events Centre. So we'll invite members to vote now to approve the May 1st, um, <clears throat> 2019 AGM minutes. So Melinda, we're actually so, gonna, um, sorry, do the voting all at once. So oh, we'll save that okay. vote for when um, Peggy sure. does hers. So there'll be three things that people are voting on in a couple of slides later on. Okay, great. So then uh, our next item is our 2019 and 20 ISMV year in review. And I'll pass that back over to Tasha. Thanks. Sure. So normally for our year in review, Isabel and I would um, be up in front of the room and giving you a bit of an update on how many sites, what species, partners, all that kind of stuff. But um, for the sake of time, um, I'm just showing a snapshot of kind of what we had been up to the last 18 months. So it's actually been almost 18 months since our last AGM. Normally we would have it in the spring, but of course our April AGM was canceled due to the pandemic. Um, so here um, is kind of what we've been up to, some fun shots. You can see some evidence of the pandemic there, some hand sanitizing stations and some masks. So these photos are from last year and some from this year as well. 
Um, and as always, you can get updates from our listserv and from our website and following us on social media. And if you are a partner um, and a member or a director, you're probably well aware of all the stuff we've been up to the last year or so. So now it's my pleasure to turn it over to Treasurer Peggy DeMarco, and she's going to present our financial report. So just a reminder, if you would like access to these statements, you can um, check out the event link that Isabel sent out earlier where you can actually download these documents. Hi everyone, I hope you can hear me. Hi Peggy, yes we can. Okay, excellent. Um, at this AGM, we ask membership to please approve the financial statements from the previous fiscal year, as well as approve the budget for the current year. As Tasha has mentioned, the statements we are voting on will be available on the web website for you to view. If there's any questions at this time, we invite members now to vote to approve the 2019-2020 financial statements as presented. Um, and then we're also going to do the vote for the budget as well. So you're going to see pop up on your screen a poll for approving the last year's AGM minutes and then the two financial statements that Peggy just mentioned. So I'm going to launch that for you right now. Just give a couple more seconds for people who would like to vote to do so. Apologies for those of you who might have phoned in. This is not something that you can participate in unless you're on a computer or a, um, a device of some kind where you can see a screen. Okay, I'm gonna give it two more seconds and I'll end the polling. Thanks everybody. So it looks like all of those um, polls were passed unanimously. All right, thank you for that. And thank you very much, Peggy. And if you have questions at any time about these statements, you can contact either Peggy or myself. All right, so now it is my honor to provide recognition and thank you to many individuals and agencies who make the ISCMB what it is. This partner list is way too long to read out, but it speaks to how much support we have within our region and throughout the province. Thanks to so many of you who are attending today who represent these partner organizations. I'd like to also recognize our staff and volunteers. You can see uh, myself and Isabel in the center there. Isabel is our operations manager and she is the other half of the staff team here at the ISCMB. And my, um, I'm super grateful to work with somebody as competent um, and enthusiastic as she is. Larissa on the left there was our summer student that we shared with the Fraser Valley group this year and we're really grateful for her help. We had volunteer Melanie Apps helping with a number of different projects this year and also want to give a shout out to some other partners that we work closely with and share office space with, Kathy Ma at the Fraser Valley and Basis Species Society and Corbin Matson and his team from the ISCBC. Next, I'd like to thank our board. This group of people is the most amazing group of people who are the reason why I love doing this work. Dan, Fiona, Elen, Julia, Jude, Carrie, Ken, Laurie, Lisa, Melinda, Paul, Peggy, Ralph, Scott. Woo! Thank you for all that you do to support the ISCMB. And this photo was taken at our last in-person board meeting in March. Do you guys remember that? We had no idea what the future was gonna hold for us at that moment. Um, I've relied on you more than ever during COVID-19, especially the executive team, and I really miss not getting together in person, but I thank you for your continued support. We say farewell to a couple of directors. They've left our board this year. Dan Hennigar from the District of West Vancouver has stepped down, and Ralph Neville from the District of North Vancouver has recently retired and now resides in Lake Country, BC. So both were on the ISCMV board for two terms, um, so which is a total of six years each. 
They both took on executive roles within their tenure. And on behalf of the ISCMV, I extend a thanks and a farewell to Dan and Ralph. And hopefully at some point in the future, we can provide more of a personal celebration and hugs when the time is right. I will now uh, turn it over to Director Scott Wamsley for the election. He's been um, helping with us, helping with our nominations committee this year. So I'll pass it over to you, Scott. Thanks, Sasha. Uh, there are six positions open on the board. We received five nominations. The following nominees are elected by acclamation for the 2020 to 2023 term. Ryan Campbell, Gwenefeer Taylor, Eileen Marcou, Laurie bates Frimmel, Paul Sipwinick. Congratulations to all the directors or to the new directors. Um, executive positions will be determined at the next board meeting. There's still one position vacant on the board. Uh, the board may appoint people to fill vacant uh, director positions during the year. If you're interested, please contact Tasha or one of the board members for more information. Great, thank you, Scott. And I'm so excited to continue working with a few of you and to welcome a couple of new members to our board as well. I'll be in touch with you shortly after our meeting today. So the final item that I wanted to cover during the AGM is just an alert to some upcoming events. These are all online. The 70th annual Washington State Weed Conference is happening November 3rd to 6th. And Isabel is gonna pop the link to that in the chat if you wanna register for that. Melinda and I were fortunate enough to attend that conference in person last year in Wenatchee. And it's a really um, great way to find out what's happening a little bit further than where most of us work. We are hosting a lunchtime forum on November 29th from 12 to 1, and the focus of that will be on Nutria, the little invasive uh, critter that you see in the photo there. We have a researcher and biologist from Oregon who will be speaking, as well as a provincial um, invasive fauna specialist from BC that will also be pro providing some local context if you'd like to learn more about that. And that is also available for registration currently. Isabel will pop the link for that into the chat so you can register right now if you like. And coming up for 2021, we don't have dates or firmed up details for these, but we'll be hosting a contractor info session. Um, so that'll be a half day session where contractors and landscapers and other land managers, anyone who wants to learn more about invasive management in Metro Vancouver can register. And we'll also be hosting our second uh, land manager planning meeting. And so if you attended that uh, last year, um, you'll be invited to attend again and hopefully we'll get additional land managers so you can watch for, for more information on that. So that wraps up our super speedy uh, AGM for 2020. Thank you for, for hanging in there with us. Here is our contact information and I am going to stop sharing our screen. And Rob, who is our next speaker, I'm gonna invite you to start sharing your screen just as I provide a quick introduction for you. And look at that, we're almost right on time. We actually have a minute to spare, so I'm, I'm glad that we have um, all the time that we said we would give to Rob to do his presentation. So Rob Underhill works as a biologist in the Southern Gulf Islands for the Maine Island Conservancy. He coordinates several restoration projects in collaboration with public land managers and private landowners, manages a small scale native plant nursery and encourages land stewardship through a landowner consultation program. Some of the challenges for habitat restoration on Maine Island include hyperabundant deer, seasonal drought and invasive plants. And I'm so thrilled that he's with us today to present information on how to manage <laughs> Daphne Loreola, which many of you may be familiar with. Um, even if you're in the Metro Vancouver area, it is definitely an up and coming species that I'm really excited to learn more about. So please uh, welcome Rob. Uh, thanks very much, Tasha. It's a pleasure to be invited to give a presentation. Um, there was someone, a speaker came from the Invasive Plant Council of Metro Vancouver a few years ago on Main Island and gave an excellent presentation on invasive plants to our local garden club. So I'm uh, pleased to be able to return the favor. Um, I've been working on projects involving Daphne for just over 10 years now 
And I've got two uh, different locations that I'll be talking about um, that can kind of give people a sense of some of the different situations uh, that can arise. And uh, hopefully the information I provide today will help some of the land managers in Metro, Metro Vancouver and in other places in the province to better manage Daphne in their areas. Uh, my first experience with Daphne was back in 2009. I had a summer co-op job with Parks Canada at Fort Rod Hill National Historic Site and worked there for a few years. So that's one of the sites I'll be talking about. Uh, the other one is here on Main Island, uh, working with the Main Island Conservancy. And uh, I should have lots of time for questions at the end. Uh, so here we go. So I, I tried to look up an original introduction date for Daphne on the West Coast, and I didn't really have much luck finding anything. Um, as most of you probably know, it's a garden ornamental, and I think we're looking at a, a series of introductions um, uh, leading up to even recently. I'm told it's still for sale in some of the nurseries around the province. Um, hopefully that might change in the future. The earliest date that I have a confirmation for is from Fort Rod Hill, where it's been established as early as the 1970s. Originally native to Europe and North Africa, it's no surprise that it's thriving under our Mediterranean climate on southern Vancouver uh, Island and in the Gulf Islands. Uh, I find Daphne is in many ways for me similar to um, English holly in that it's shade tolerant, it's a bird dispersed species, and it's relatively slow to grow and, and establish but that rate of spread increases exponentially as the populations increase. Uh, and it's, I think it's kind of snuck up on us a little bit um, in that way. Um, we'll also be talking a little bit about the poisonous nature of, of Daphne and some of the challenges associated with management uh, largely related to its bird dispersal. So those of you who aren't familiar with Daphne, it's an evergreen shrub uh, grows to about one and a half meters tall. It uh, looks a little bit like a rhododendron. Um, I think it also looks a little bit like a, uh, what's it called, the Mexican orange blossom, the Choisia ternata. Uh, so those are also good plants that um, people can recommend to people who like, like Daphne and want to have it in their gardens. It's got a, a small uh, cluster of yellow flowers, uh, which um, form uh, a black, a purplish black uh, droop later in the summer. And uh, both the flowers and the blackberries are, are not very showy. They're often hidden underneath the whorl of leaves. Uh, from a, a management perspective, if you're in a situation where you're annually ma uh, managing the species, um, you could set a target date for management actions to be completed by mid-June. That's around anything after that you risk having the berries being mature enough to be distributed. <clears throat> so when I was working at uh, Fort Rod Hill, there was a researcher from a university in Japan who came to Fort Rod Hill and he was studying what habitats Daphne was thriving in. And uh, I remember he had this really amazing uh, camera setup. It was basically a, tra a trail camera, but he had what was obviously a, a custom fabricated uh, box um, that would house a, a common um, uh, kind of shockproof, waterproof uh, point and shoot camera. And the box had a motion sensing uh, device on it and a little button that would, that would go down and push, turn on the, uh, the camera to take two different shots. And uh, he ended up with these excellent infrared photos of um, the bird species that were distributing, uh, dispersing the Daphne, which was uh, the American Robin and Cedar Waxwing. Uh, we also ended up with hundreds of pictures of deer, <laughs> more than we had expected to see. But what uh, Thomas found was that Daphne is showing a strong preference for um, uh, 
kind of a mixed uh, sun exposure and especially in edge habitats. And I think that reflects, that edge habitat preference reflects not only the, um, the preferred light exposure, but also the preferred habitat for the birds that are dispersing the berries. Aside from birds dispersing the berries, what I've observed is when we remove mature plants, we quite commonly see uh, quite a few seedlings directly underneath the mature plants. And uh, so if you're managing Daphne, that's something you definitely want to um, take care during your initial removals that you're not just removing the larger plants uh, or volunteers aren't just removing the larger plants, but all of the smaller seedlings that are growing underneath as well. As I mentioned, Daphne is a relatively slow species to grow and mature. I don't have an exact number of years that it takes to mature, but based on my observations, it's somewhere between three and four years. And typically plants that are greater than 25 centimeters in height are, are producing berries. Um, it's pretty uncommon to see smaller plants that are mature. And so I'll talk a little bit about the habitats a bit more when I get to the specific examples of the sites at Fort Rod Hill and on Main Island. But I chose this photo for the reason uh, there's not actually any Daphne in this in this photo. Uh, but for me, it's emblematic of a pr uh, prime habitat in which Daphne will grow. It's a slightly wetter forest ecosystem. Uh, it's got a, a history of human disturbance. In this case, it was um, previously cleared for agriculture. Uh, it's also got a high level of deer browse. So in the photo you can see a few sword ferns that are uh, nibbled down. Um, and this is a site uh, on Main Island that is not yet invaded by Daphne, but I expect uh, it will be in the coming coming years. And so if you're familiar with the, um, the biogeoclimatic uh, classification system in BC, uh, the ecosystems on Main Island that we're most commonly seeing Daphne uh, thrive in is the, the O4 and the O6 ecosystem types, especially when you see those ecosystem types in combination with uh, recent logging or historic cultural history. And uh, the earliest written reference we have for Main Island Daphne is 1986. Um, it's probably a little bit earlier than that. And again, repeat introductions. <clears throat> and the other thing, uh, both at Fort Rod Hill and on Main Island, that's helping the Daphne to spread and establish is, um, in both those cases, there's an enormous amount of, of deer, which are reducing competition with other plants that, that would compete, such as salal and sword fern. On Main Island, we have not only a, a, a large population of black-tailed deer, but we also have a second uh, invasive species, fallow deer. So the toxicity of Daphne, I think, uh, can often be the, the, the motivation for removal, especially for land managers uh, who are managing uh, sites where there's a lot of uh, public access, or for homeowners and, and landowners who um, don't want poisonous plants in their, in their yard. And um, it's, a, it's a consideration for management. It also can be a tool for public outreach to encourage landowners to remove this plant from their own properties. And so um, when I worked for Parks Canada at Fort Rod Hill, uh, we had a, a very successful volunteer program with hundreds of different volunteers. And of all of the people that I've worked with, with Daphne, I've only seen about two or three of them who get this uh, skin rash. And it develops as kind of a, a raised welt, uh, often on the forearms where people have come in contact with the leaves and stems. Uh, whether or not Daphne is causing um, longer term uh, problems for people who, even though they don't get the rash, is, is, is another question. So I think even if people aren't getting uh, the rash, it's best to be cautious. So I would recommend when working with Daphne that uh, you wear gloves, long sleeve shirt, long pants. Um, and there's a great publication by WorkSafe BC and in that they're also recommending uh, goggles to prevent sap droplets from getting into the eyes. Uh, there are, uh, there is a case again from the WorkSafe BC document 
about uh, poisoning. There was a child who died in Nova Scotia, according to their publication. And um, a quick literature review shows that uh, a number of the different chemicals contained within Daphne are known carcinogens and skin irritants. So the physical removal of the plant, this slide may be um, the probably the most important part of, of what I can, can tell different land managers. Uh, and that's related to uh, the re-sprouting from the roots. So uh, I, I noticed that there was a number of different um, references on the different invasive uh, species management websites that claim it re-sprouts from roots. And I'm not sure where that's coming from. I suspect it may have been uh, something that's just been perpetuated from website to, to website. Um, at Fort Rod Hill, uh, there's been three people who have been uh, involved in Daphne management, kind of on the ground as the lead people in the last 20 years. Uh, those have been Conan Webb, myself, and Nathan Fisk. And that's management going back to early 2000s to the present. I spoke with both Conan and Nathan uh, before the presentation here, and all three of us agree that uh, Daphne does not re-sprout from, from roots, uh, and we've, none of us have ever seen that, that happen. Uh, it does readily re-sprout low on the stem, and sometimes that low stem is, is buried uh, by the dirt. So that's probably also where that, uh, that misinformation may be coming from. But from a management perspective, there is no need to pull the entire plant out of the ground. As long as you're cutting deep enough to cut into the root tissues, you won't have any, any re-sprouts. And I think that's an important distinction to make. If any of you um, have access or responsibility for managing the content on the various websites out there, I encourage you to uh, look at that content just to make sure it accurately represents the growth habit of the plant. Um, in most cases, uh, hand pruners are a sufficient tool to cut the stem. It's a much softer stem than um, scotch broom, for example. And uh, for the larger plants, loppers or sometimes even a uh, handsaw are required. Um, a lot of volunteers want to pull the plants by hand. And this is fine for small plants, smaller than 15 centimeters in height. But for larger plants, um, it can be hard on the backs of the volunteers, uh, maybe not until the next day. Um, it can also cause unnecessary and undesirable soil disturbance in locations where you're trying to maintain and promote the growth of other native plants in, in the area. So uh, cutting is the recommended method for plants larger than 15 centimeters. In terms of a disposal, um, you don't want to burn, uh, burn Daphne. You also want to avoid any um, management methods that involve uh, crushing or, or, um, or uh, unnecessary cutting of the stem. So line trimmers, uh, brush saws, things like that um, will release a volatile chemical. Uh, just like the, the skin rashes, different people seem to have a different sensitivity to the the, the, the volatiles, uh, but it can cause respiratory uh, problems. People report uh, sore throats or actually a constricted feeling in, in their throat. So we want to avoid burning it. Um, you also want to avoid, if you are transporting it, you want to really avoid transporting it in a closed space. So don't put it in a van, for example. Um, our method of, of disposal, disposal it's primarily been to find a place on site where we can make a pile of it and let it decompose naturally. Um, if you're a homeowner, uh, I would recommend against composting it in your, your food compost just to be on the safe side to avoid any of those um, known chemicals getting into your food supply. Uh, so I, uh, I have a picture here, it's not Daphne, it's English holly, but I wanted to talk a little bit about the bird dispersal and, and why that is such a challenge for managing the species in, in specific locations. Um, so the, the main challenges for, for Daphne are, um, it's labor intensive to initially remove, although I think that's, that's totally feasible. Um, within two or three years, you get, uh, 
a big flush of seedlings coming up and that's time consuming and a little bit tedious. Um, but the biggest problem is that if you're managing a, a location that's surrounded by other areas, uh, other Daphne populations, you're perpetually having seed spread, uh, seeds brought back into the site by birds. And so, uh, especially in a place like Maine Island, uh, or it's equally valid on uh, at Fort Rod Hill, you've got adjacent areas with, with populations. And so, um, you get to a certain point, no matter how much you invest in your specific site, um, you're, not, you're not making any more headway. And in the case of some of our sites on Maine Island, we actually expect the resources that we need to maintain the area free of Daphne are gonna increase as the populations outside of our management area increase. In some cases, um, you may want to consider uh, actually managing those source populations if if they're isolated populations um, or if there's there's resources to do that. <clears throat> so I'm going to talk about the first two examples here. Um, we'll look more closely at these. Uh, so Fort Rod Hill is a Parks Canada managed site. It's um, part of it is the National Historic Site. Um, and then there's uh, some adjacent natural areas as well that are included within their invasive plant management. Um, they've had a very effective program, um, and I would present Fort Rod Hill as um, a, a good example in that um, the, the infestation was uh, far advanced before any management uh, began, so it kind of represents a, a worst case scenario from an a situ a, a infestation situation perspective. Um, the habitat is a lot of appropriate habitat, prime habitat for Daphne, a lot of edge habitat associated with, with past human history. Um, but it's also an ideal situation from um, a resource perspective. So you've got an organization like Parks Canada that has the, the resources to apply to the, to the problem. And they, they have, they've run a really effective volunteer program um, for invasive plant management, including Daphne. As you can see, uh, you know, over the last 10 years in which uh, they were recording person hours, they've done over, you know, 9,600 9, hours. Obviously, that's a, a huge investment. <coughs> and I just want to thank uh, Nathan at Parks Canada for, for providing me some of their up-to-date uh, data on that, um, which I'm going to show in this slide here. So, the, the big takeaway for me on this slide is that, and sorry, this is uh, this is person hours. Um, this is person hours here on the on the axis. Um, what we see here at Fort Rod Hill is that um, despite a huge investment of of person hours over time, uh, you know, it hasn't the, the the need for investment of hours hasn't gone down significantly. Um, they have been very successful at, at maintaining Daphne essentially free of uh, some really important habitat for species at risk. Um, but even after uh, 20, it's actually been managed since, since 1999 at that site. So even after 20 years of management, they still have uh, untreated areas there. And like I said, they have adjacent areas that are bringing seeds into their management sites. So it's kind of a, a constant uh, challenge. And so my next example here is, is Maine Island. Uh, it's in the Gulf Islands between Galliano to the north and North Pender Island to the south. It's about 2100 hectares. Uh, so to give you a sense of that, you can drive across the island in about 10 or 15 minutes, no matter where you are. <clears throat> and it's got a couple situations that have uh, been conducive to the spread of Daphne. Uh, one is it has a long history of human disturbance. Um, about 30% of the island has been converted to other land uses, uh, primarily agriculture, as you can see from this 2009 air photo. Um, and the second one is, um, uh, as I mentioned, the, the high deer browse, which is um, kind of limited the uh, pace at which some of these ecosystems have recovered from past human human land and reduce the, the competition with some of our native of plants which are susceptible to deer browse. And this is just gives you some context of the human um, 
the pri private property distribution on, on Main Island, which I'll talk about a little bit more. Um, we have a, a landowner contact program, and I've had the pleasure of, of joining over 100 of our landowners on um, walkabouts on their properties to do consultations. And so that's enabled me to get a pretty good picture of what's happening on Main Island in terms of uh, species distributions, including Daphne. And uh, a couple of years ago, um, I made this map actually, it, it could use a little bit of updating, but I just wanted to kind of visual dis visually display where some of the more dense Daphne patches were on the island, because it's really inconsistent. Um, Daphne is still, even though it's been on Main Island since at least the mid eighties, it's still pretty early on and it's just in its, uh, its growth and spread. And each year we can see it's continuing to spread into new areas. But the main kind of areas that it is, that are in is, uh, <clears throat> there's a valley bottom that runs along here that has a history of, of logging and agriculture, uh, but nothing that's uh, very little current agriculture. And then this area here has uh, both a history of agriculture and is now the, um, uh, a location where we have a lot of um, uh, recreate, uh, residential development. So a lot of edge habitat associated with uh, homes and, and yards. And those are kind of the two main areas. I'm gonna go through one by one and talk about the, uh, primarily the first two, but I'll mention the other ones as well, where we're actually actively managing Daphne on the island. There's no island-wide effort to uh, manage it. And um, in a lot of cases, these are large properties. So for example, there's a 47 hectare, and remember Fort Rod Hill with all of their resources was 54 hectares. There's a, there's a 47 hectare property in this valley bottom with property owners that, you know, they don't even live on the property. <clears throat> and it's, that's the most highly invaded property on the island. So there's some really real um, resource barriers to to managing uh, Daphne on a landscape level. And so uh, the first site we're gonna talk about is Bennett Bay. It's part of the Gulf Islands National Park Reserve. And as you can see, it's adjacent to a more heavily invaded area. And so this is our site here. And the private properties here, there's some larger private properties and there's a very dense patch of Daphne through here. Um, Daphne was never fully established within the park but it is outside. And so we've been, every year, we spend just one, maybe two days, so one volunteer day uh, for about four hours, removing Daphne and we remove every single Daphne that we can find across the whole site. It takes, you know, maybe 10 person hours or something like that. And uh, because it's such a small scale, what we've been doing is actually counting all the individuals that we remove uh, oh, sorry. Uh, so to give you a sense of what kind of ecosystems are present at, at Bennett Bay, it's a drier uh, forest type, uh, primarily Douglas fir with, with um, Arbutus. And this is a picture of the uh, one of the private properties adjacent to the park where there's a, a higher uh, population of Daphne. This is also one of the shadier places I've seen Daphne growing in such thick numbers. It's a uh, uh, second growth Douglas fir forest with a history of, of cattle grazing. And so here are the number of individuals that we've removed on an annual basis at Bennett Bay. And just what I want you to take away from this slide is that like Fort Rod Hill, the amount of uh, individuals removed each year has, is not decreasing. In fact, uh, if anything, I, I get the sense that it's going up and we expect it to continue going up as the populations adjacent to the park increase. Uh, so the next one I'll talk about is here at uh, Mount Park Regional Park. So this is a 49 hectare area. Um, it's less suitable habitat for Daphne in a lot of portions of the park in that it's a bit too shaded. So there's a, a ridge top that runs uh, across the park to the south here. And this area here is largely um, a north facing slope with a mature canopy of, of trees. And so it's a little bit uh, too shaded for where Daphne likes to grow. Some of these uh, restoration sites that I've got on the map here are, um, they're a bit more open and they had a higher uh, number of Daphne 
And so our management at this location, uh, because it's such a large area, uh, we do it all in, in one year. And so each year we manage uh, all of the, the restoration zones each year. And then once every three years, we do one third of the rest of the, the park um, to ensure that we are trying to cover um, all of the ground. We send our staff out with um, handheld GPSs with the track function on, so we can kind of get a sense of where they've walked just to ensure we're not missing large areas of the park. And we're just removing, um, you know, dozens or maybe a hundred Daphne plants in any given year. So it's very much uh, a maintenance uh, level management. And the other two locations where we are managing Daphne are Henderson Community Park, which is 10 hectares, which is here, and St. John Point Regional Park here. And so those are both similar to Mount Park in that they're, they don't have established Daphne populations. And so we're, we're maintaining them, but it's not a huge investment in resources. It's, it's one day for each park per year. Uh, the bulk of the, the Daphne on Main Island is on private properties. And as I mentioned, that uh, 47 hectare property, this isn't it, but it it's, gives you a, a, a sense of scale, is a lot of these properties are, are too big to have invasive plant management be within the resources available to the individual landowners. And certainly um, taking on an island-wide management at this scale would be beyond the resources of a small organization like the main island conservancy and so that's kind of where we're at now we're managing uh invasive uh, daphne in select sites but we're expecting the resources required to do that to increase over time and uh i'm curious if anyone has advice on what you know where does that lead us in in 10 years uh i'd love to have that that conversation so Tasha, uh, that's it for me. If there's questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you. I do have one question from Pamela Zevit in Surrey. So do they do better with some form of seed scarification, such as passing through bird guts, or can the seeds <coughs> propagate at similar rates without that impact? Yeah, so uh, we, we actually tried to answer that question when I was with Parks Canada by collecting uh, a bunch of Daphne berries and subjecting them to a hydrochloric acid uh, treatment. And then, um, uh, and then of course we had a control and we had a, a tra trays of, of Daphne set up to observe the difference in germination. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I think we may have had some other factor uh, preventing our germination because we had these, you know, huge amount of, of, of uh, propagation trays laid out <clears throat> at the Pacific Forestry Center for for two years and we didn't observe a single Daphne berry germinating um, and then I, I was kind of funny I went to clean up all of the trays in the, the third year basically to, to decommission what we were viewing as a failed experiment and it wasn't until that third year we had about a half dozen uh, Daphne berries that had germinated in the trays at that time so if there's anything that we actually learned from that experience it was that uh, Daphne is seeds are dormant for at least two years in the soil. Um, but we we see them uh, growing commonly underneath the, the, the plants and it's possible the, the birds are you know sitting there on the Daphne plant long enough to digest the berry but I, I think it's more likely that those are um, plants that have germinated from seeds that haven't passed through the, the gut of a bird. So I think I, I would say Daphne uh, does not require passing through the gut of a bird. Great. We have a contribution from Ken Marr who's joining us from the Royal BC Museum. He says the earliest specimen we have of the species in the museum herbarium is from 1968 collected from government house. <laughs> Thank awesome. you Ken. Yeah, yeah. thanks. That's, that's great. Another question from David Clements. Are there any other island level management efforts underway, like on Salt Spring Island? Uh, I, I don't believe so. Um, um, no, I don't believe that there's any island level management efforts anywhere, uh, including Maine Island. 
All right, uh, another question from Laurie Bates Frymel. Kudos to you for taking on this challenge in Maine Island. How are you alerting the residents about this invader? Where does your funding for this program come from? Yeah, uh, so funding for the individual restoration projects comes from a variety of sources. Um, the Eco Action Funding Program through Environment Canada has been one of our larger, more notable sources of funding. Um, and they're, they're not just funding specifically invasive plant management, but also um, a lot of uh, uh, restoration of, of native vegetation, which we propagate uh, on island in our native plant nursery. Um, some of the other funders include uh, the Victoria Foundation, um, TD Friends of the Environment Foundation, BC Gaming Grants, um, uh, HCTF more recently. It's been a, a funding partner for us. Um, and in terms of how we're uh, uh, reaching out to the community of Maine Island for, for management, <clears throat> we do that through um, mostly through our landowner contact program. So that's where we're uh, joining landowners on site on their properties to talk about not just invasive plant management, but conservation of other natural habitats on their, on their properties. Um, we haven't made a really concerted um, effort to try and eradicate Daphne on Maine Island. Uh, I think that individual property owners, especially on smaller properties, could be very successful at removing it and eradicating it from their properties. But I, I have trouble visualizing a situation where um, Daphne is eradicated from the entirety of, of Maine Island based on my experiences at, at Fort Rod Hill especially. Great, we have a few more questions coming in, but I'm gonna save those and send them to you right afterwards, Rob, for you to address later. Um, Cause I wanna uh, leave with just a little bit of time to do some thank yous. Um, so yeah, rest assured if you've um, sent some questions in the chat or if you want to do so in the next few minutes that our speakers will be able to address those. And now just a, a quick wrap up time for some thank yous. Thanks again to Richard and Rob, um, excellent speakers. Thank you for taking the time to be with us today. And um, it's great that Rob could join us. You probably otherwise wouldn't have been able to travel to uh, the mainland. It would have been a larger effort to get you here. So really? um, I'm grateful that this online forum allowed this uh, sharing across the ocean. <laughs> Uh, thanks to all the directors who helped with the AGM and all the behind the scenes in order to make today work. And thanks to my forum committee volunteers who also help advise on these kinds of events. And thanks to all of you for, for joining us and we hope to see you again. And as if we were meeting in person, I am happy to stay back and chat or answer any questions you may have. So I'm going to say goodbye, but I'm not going to sign out of the meeting in case you want to um, chat with me or, or anybody else.